Hey folks, NickMock007 here again. Now, real quick, please excuse the tank behind me. I ran out of CO2 last week, but in my complacency, I didn't actually realize it until this weekend, so I'll be getting CO2 refilled Monday morning. Uh, but yeah, the balance is, well, not. So no close-ups today for sure. All right, for the topic today, now, I know a few folks have covered it before, but I also wanted to cover it on my channel because uh, it's something that's important to me. Uh, and I think I can add something new to the discussion as well. So we're going to take a look at the important, albeit morbid, topic of euthanasia. And I'll discuss both fish and invertebrates here. Uh, a disclaimer, when I reference euthanasia in this series, I'm only going to refer to it in regards to non-human animals. So just wanted to get that out of the way. Now, normally, I'm kind of a bit goofy in these videos, but I'm going to take a bit more of a somber tone in this series. Um, I haven't lost my sense of humor, um, and I'll have some more uplifting videos in the near future. But in this series, I'm going to be slightly more serious, um, as I want to approach this topic with some respect. Okay. To that end, I'm going to split this into a three-part mini-series. Uh, in the first episode, I'm going to take a brief look at the history and ethics of euthanasia. In part two, uh, we'll take an overview of uh, euthanasia uh, methods and uh, examine topics such as unconsciousness, perception of pain, distress, and the human-animal relationship. Then finally, in part three, uh, we're going to delve into the mechanisms um, and the specific methods to humanely euthanize your fish and invertebrates. Uh, I know many of you may only be interested in that third part uh, when I talk about how to euthanize, um, and that's fine. Uh, you're welcome to skip these first two parts. But for those of you interested in the science of it all, uh, stick with me, um, and I think we can all learn a lot. All right. So let me give you a little bit of kind of uh, my own sort of personal ethics here. Let me say, I, I don't kill things. I'm the type of soft-hearted guy that when I catch a bug, I let it back outside. Uh, we recently had some mice get into our house. Um, we had a pretty cold winter here. Uh, and the ones that my cats don't catch, I've been uh, using these live uh, capture uh, traps and then releasing them unharmed. Uh, my theory is that unless you're faced with choosing, well, maybe I should say it this way, unless I'm faced with choosing between my life and someone else's, uh, I'm not going to take another person or creature's life. Uh, I just don't think that's up to me. Now, but as a responsible pet owner, sometimes the issue cannot be avoided when we've decided to take the responsibility of caring for animals. So, with all that said, I hate the idea of killing our pets. Worse off, with dogs and cats, which I have a lot of, uh, you can consult with a veterinarian and, and actually get some help in making this decision. But with our fish, we're kind of left on our own. We're sort of floating out there. Well, except remember the community uh, here on YouTube and, and your favorite fish forum. Um, I think I can safely say that we're all here to help each other. So. I could just jump right into how to euthanize, but if you've been watching my channel for any length of time, uh, you certainly know my stance on putting the cart before the horse. There are tons and tons of informational avenues out there on the internet on, on how to euthanize, and if that's all you're interested in, like I say, just come back and watch part three of my series, or Google it, or go watch someone else's channel. But I want to focus on the bigger picture, so we can make the best choices. And that's why we're going to take this stepwise, and today I'm just going to start the series by focusing on um, history and ethics of, of euthanasia, again, for animals. Uh, I'm going to focus on what the scientific community has to say about this issue, but uh, I wanted to point out that just, you know, even organizations such as PETA, whose intentions are, are in my opinion, clearly good, but at times can be a little bit extreme, but even PETA recognizes that euthanasia is necessary sometimes. So for this series, um, again, we're going to focus on the scientific community. I, I went to the uh, American Veterinary Medical Association, or AVMA, um, as they're typically considered to be one of the thought leaders on this topic. As most of the information, um, and, and most of the information that I'll talk about today is actually based on one of their white papers, um, a link uh, is going to be in the description below if you want to go check it out yourself. Uh, this paper is about 100 pages or so long, and uh, obviously I'm not going to try to uh, uh, go through 100 pages here, uh, but I'm going to pull out some things that I think are most interesting um, for us in the um, uh, fish keeping hobby. So let's take a step back in time now. Now, starting in 1963, the 
ABMA developed a panel on euthanasia, uh, and these guidelines initially only looked at dogs, cats, and small mammals. But these guidelines are updated uh, every several years, and they've been expanded to include really just about all animals at this point. Uh, since 1986, they have been providing um, specific recommendations for aquatic life, and obviously that's what we're going to focus on. Now, the most recent report that they've put out is from 2013, so we've got a, a very recent uh, paper, and it resulted from the efforts of over 60 individuals, um, as well as the larger veterinary community, but these included uh, veterinarians, behaviorists, uh, psychologists, ethicists, and, and so on. Okay. That's all fine and well, but, but we need a definition. What is euthanasia? Well, euthanasia is derived from the Greek terms eu, meaning good, and thanatos, meaning death. The term is usually used to describe uh, ending the life of an individual animal in a way that minimizes or eliminates pain and distress. Uh, a good death is tantamount to the humane termination of an animal's life. Now, when we euthanize a pet, we need to consider two points, okay? Uh, one, that it's our duty to induce death in a manner that is in the animal's interest uh, and or welfare. And two, that we use humane techniques to induce the most rapid, painless, and distress-free death possible. All right, we're going to break these two points down a little bit further. So point one, we're trying to do what's best for the animal. Now, this occurs when death is a welcome event. Uh, and continued existence is not an attractive option for the animal as perceived by us, the fish keeper. Now, to determine this, uh, we need to consider a couple things, the animal's welfare or, or quality of life. What does that actually mean? So scientists typically consider quality of life to be determined by three factors, um, that the animal functions well, so you know, able to swim around the tank, that kind of thing, feels well, and has the capacity to perform uh, behaviors that are innate to its species. And so that's the kinds of things that we can uh, observe, behaviors. When euthanasia relieves the animal's suffering, then it can be considered a positive outcome. Now for point two, we need to consider humane technique. So once the decision to euthanize has actually been made, the goal is to minimize pain, distress, and negative effect. And thus, we turn our attention to the technique. This is the area where I'm going to focus on the third video. Uh, so come back and watch that uh, as I get through these first two parts. But suffice to say that as human beings, it's our responsibility to ensure that if an animal's life is to be taken, uh, that we do it with the highest degree of respect and with an emphasis on making death as painless and distress-free as possible. I know I'm repeating myself a bit, but, but these are, are pretty key points here. Now, the techniques that I'll present will focus on rapid loss of consciousness followed by cardiac, respiratory arrest, um, and ultimately the loss of brain function, while at the same time, again, minimizing that distress. But when considering the ethics of euthanasia, it should be obvious, but I'm going to say it nonetheless, death is final. And in cases where an animal no longer has a good life, uh, however, death can also be uh, a permanent end to any and all future harms and, and, and poor quality of life for the animal. Now, I know most of us are not veterinarians, but I still find it interesting to look at some decision trees that professionals uh, would, would use and go through before uh, euthanizing a family pet. Uh, now, while not all of these points on these trees are, are going to be you know, exactly applicable to us, the figures still provide some valuable information on uh, the difficult decision. So I'm going to put up these two figures and you can pause the video if you want to look at them uh, in more depth because they're, um, they take a second to really go through. Now, the second decision tree in particular, I think helps us make the right choices in these kinds of tough decisions. Again, I'm not going to read you every step along this decision tree, uh, but it examines things like personal integrity, uh, the process of making decisions um, to, to euthanize an animal. Uh, our own conscience, and, and, and uh, things like public opinion. So I hope you take a second and just look at it. Um, maybe, you know, you never have to use it again. So if you do have to make that decision, I think these charts can help us start to think through the process and think through on uh, whether we're coming to a good decision. I'm going to pause part one here. Uh, thanks to those of you who watched this whole thing. Uh, I know this is a difficult topic to talk about. 
But uh, I think it's important, like I said in the beginning, and um, I think it's a responsibility that we take on as fish keepers. So I'll see you next week for part two. Uh, I hope everyone uh, had a good weekend, and until then.